I'll begin to see it. And if I can see it in myself, other people will see it too, and that's all that will matter. And so I begin to paddle around the path of life, just like I always did. And I noticed this, because I'm an analyzer, and I became painfully aware right off that something had happened and something had changed with me. And it wasn't because I got up in the morning and poured all my booze down the sink, and it wasn't because I burned all my playing cards, and it wasn't because I dropped all my membership to all those bad places that I belonged to, and it wasn't because I went down and joined the church and got baptized and made a public confession of faith. Oh, no, the change that I began to notice was that there was something funny going on, not outside of me, but inside of me. I didn't get the assurance of salvation by looking at the outside of me. I got it by looking at the inside of me. Down in the inner man there was something going on that had never gone on there before. And I became aware that there was some one inside of me at work in me, making me feel like I didn't want to feel, think like I didn't want to think and talk like I didn't want to talk and do what I didn't want to do. And he was slowly and surely making me be what I didn't want to be. There was something going on down inside of me, brethren. A few months later, I found myself down here in the hills of West Virginia, riding horseback and telling people, about what Jesus did for me. And everything went pretty smooth till I went into the ministry, quote unquote. And when I went into the ministry or into full time service for God, as they like to say, I tell you, I got introduced to the person of Satan and I got introduced to the ravages of a heart of flesh that had never changed. An enemy locked up inside of me who attacked me from within, and every time I thought I got all of the gates of my life shut up, he unlocked them from the inside and let the enemy in like a flood. Do you know what I'm talking about? And as I began to see some of this conflict down inside of me, I heard a voice whispering up here in my mind, and it was saying, Are you sure you say it? Now, what you just thought wasn't much like a Christian thought. And what you said wasn't much like a Christian word. And what you just did didn't resemble too much of a Christian deed. And the attitude you have isn't really what I'd call a Christian attitude. How do you know that you're really saved? Maybe you're just deceived again. Maybe you've only had an hallucination again. Maybe you've only had a religious experience again. Maybe this is no more real than all of the other times have been. Maybe you've only believed in your mind and not really in your heart. Hey, it was a desperate battle for me. And one day I just said, Lord, I want to know how to know whether I'm really saved. What is the assurance of salvation? And this is what he told me, and he's never changed his message to me since. You've been making the mistake of looking outside. Look inside. Look back over just these few short months. Who made you want to leave your home and come down to this God-forsaken place and tell a bunch of people who really don't want you here about an unseen and invisible person you can't produce at sight. And what is it down inside of you that makes you love what you used to hate and hate what you used to love? What is it down inside of you that makes you love the Bible when just a few months ago you thought a sentence to hell would be reading the Bible for the rest of your life? What is it that makes you hungry down inside for more and more and more about Jesus? What is it down inside of you 
that makes you love people. And you can't help yourself when you know very good and well if you were honest, you'd say you didn't even like them. What is this going on down inside of you that motivates you, that moves you, that touches you? What is this strange thing down inside of you if it isn't Jesus himself? It wasn't there a month ago or two months ago or six months ago or a year ago when you made all those promises and you made all those pledges and you tried to straighten up the outside of your life and walk the line. What is this power at work down inside of you if it isn't a person? Do you think that's the devil doing that? No, no. It's not the devil doing that. He told me it's me. He's never told me anything any different. Now, I want to expound this, and I want to explain it. I don't care if this does take three C-90s or four C-120s. I want to tell you what the salvation, the assurance of salvation is. John says, These, listen, these things have I written unto you that ye may know that ye have eternal life who believe the name of the Son of God. How do I know I have believed in a saving way on the name of the Son of God? How do I know that in a believing way I have believed the record God has given of His Son? I know it this way. I know it by the things that John wrote to me in this epistle. Now, what things did he write in this epistle? The things he wrote in this epistle are the evidences of the life of Jesus Christ. Not his life on earth, the characteristics of his life. The unique things about the life of Jesus Christ. Now, let me make myself plain. God has given to us eternal life, and that life is in His Son. He that has the Son has life. What I'm saying to you is that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is synonymous with eternal life. Eternal life, therefore, is not just an unending sentence of life. It is not just timelessness. It is just not everlasting life. Everybody has everlasting life. The sinner is going to live everlasting life. Eternal life has to do with the quality of life. It is the life of the eternal God. And the life of the eternal God is in me, God's gift to me, by the miracle of the incarnation of His Son, Jesus Christ. He's given to me His Son, therefore I have the same quality, the same nature of life that God Himself has. You with me? You with me? Become partaker of a divine nature. Been born again. That's what I told you last Sunday morning. Now, the things that are recorded in 1 John are the evidences of that nature. The fruit of it. The byproduct of it. The symptoms of it. The outward manifestation of it. If that life, if that nature is in you, certain things are going to happen. You're going to feel a certain way about certain things, think certain things about certain things, react in certain ways that you've never reacted before. But I promise you this, none of the things in 1 John can be counterfeited. None of the things can be conjured up by man in the flesh. He has to base his assurance on something that he can conjure up. These are things that can't be counterfeited because they are divine things and produced only by the energy of eternal life. I, I do, oh, I so want to make this message clear to you. In Acts, the first chapter, I love it, that after the resurrection, the writer of Acts says that Jesus showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. Isn't that wonderful? 
by many infallible proofs, he showed to those around him that he was indeed alive. Let me take a principle from that verse. Now, when a man gets saved, Jesus Christ doesn't walk up and down the streets of Jerusalem apart from him. He walks up and down the streets of Jerusalem in him. And his ministry is not by many infallible proofs to show himself alive to a Christ-rejecting world, but by many infallible proofs to show himself alive to the one he lives in. What I care if the world knows whether Jesus is alive or not. What I care about is whether I know he's alive or not. Because I'm going to be honest. Maybe you people aren't honest. I'm going to tell you how it is in my heart. I care about me first. I'm more concerned about me going to heaven than I am about you. Now, after I'm sure about me going to heaven, I can be concerned about you, but I ain't got no time to worry about you unless I know whether I'm going or not. And least of all, I got no business worrying about you unless I know I'm going. This is a big message. It's getting bigger. You know, you know, I, I got suckered in with a lot of this false teaching because I got a good mind, regardless of what some of you think. <laughs> The reason you think I don't have a good mind is because I don't use it too much. I'm saving it. <laughs> but I have a good mind, and I think and reason and analyze, you know. And I got suckered in with some of this stuff. I used to think that God was interested in pressing the world around me with his reality, and that's what he used me for. I thought that that was my main function, was that God could use me to glorify himself to others. And one day when he did something through me that I thought glorified him in the eyes of others, and I was thanking him for glorifying himself in the eyes of others, he spoke to me in my heart with a very sad voice, and he said, Oh, I'm more interested in glorifying myself in your eyes than I am in the eyes of any man on earth. Why? Because he said, You're my bride. And frankly, he said, I want to impress you. I want you to look at me and say, you're the only man in my life. I want you to look at me and glorify me. I want you to look at me and love me. And when you do this, <laughs> I'll be glorified in the eyes of others because you'll just be walking around out there in a daze in love with Jesus and the whole world will see it. That's what witnessing is. Read the Song of Solomon. A little maiden so much in love with her beloved as she ran up and down the streets crying, have you seen my beloved? She didn't say, hey, all of you come together. My beloved wants to be glorified in your eyes. She went up and down the world telling them how he had been glorified in her eyes. And that's what evoked from the world around her the inquiry, who is thy beloved? You want somebody to want to know Jesus? They'll never want to know him until they see that it works in your life. How can you talk to people about the reality of Jesus in their life when he's not real in yours? That's the first important thing that God wants to establish in the believer. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> hey, I'll tell you how he taught me the assurance of salvation. By showing me the infallible proofs of his reality by making himself known in me that's the testimony that I have in me the testimony I have in me is Christ in me Christ living in me making himself known to me showing me the evidences of his life in me you got the message suppose you visited my house today but supposing I wasn't there. Supposing I was absent and you drove in my driveway and somebody came out and you said, does Herb Rouse really live in that house? And they said, yes, he really does. And they said, well, prove it to me. Take me in the house and show him to me. And they said, well, I can't do that because 
due to the nature of the circumstances, I just can't show him to you at the moment, but believe me, he does live mm -hmm. there. Well, how do you know he lives there? Well, take a tour of the house with me, and you'll see the evidences of his life every place. His touches on the whole house. I'm not talking about decorating. <laughs> you see my hat laying on the chair. You see my coat hanging in the closet. You see my pencil and paper laying on the desk. You may see my wristwatch on the nightstand. You may see a thousand things that are evidences that I live there. If I didn't live there, why would all these things be scattered around in that house? Jesus lives in me due to the nature of the circumstances. I can't show him to you so that you can see him with your natural eye. But I'll tell you this, his touch is on the house of my life. And his things are scattered all over the house of my heart. Everywhere I look, <laughs> I see his footprints. And every time I listen, I hear his voice. I look within, brethren, and I see the evidences of a life inside of me that I never got from Adam. And a life inside of me that I didn't conjure up. Because if I'd been conjured it up, it'd never come out like that. I want to tell you a little bit about that house and the one who lives in it. And I want to tell you how faithful he is never to change a thing. Well, I went to sleep last night, or this morning rather. I wasn't even thinking about the message because I was practicing my little thing. And my little thing is to ask the Lord to just clean off the desk of my mind and just close my heart up for the night <laughs> so I can rest. And so when I get ready to go to sleep, I said, Lord, I'm not going to think about anything. I'm not going to get lost in the message tonight because the message will take care of itself when the time for the message comes. The message is in me because the message is a person. So I went to sleep that way, and at 2.30 this morning, I hadn't only been asleep about two hours or maybe an hour and a half, I woke up wide awake. You remember what I told you about that? Now, I don't think anybody but Jesus has the right to wake me up at 2.30 in the morning. But if he wants to wake me up at 2.30, that's fine with me. If he's got something he wants to say, or if he's some, something that he needs to hear from me. And at 2.30, I was wide awake. I just opened my eyes like that. And instantly, when I opened my eyes, he spoke to me. Say, how do you know it was him? Well, heck, there wasn't anybody else there. <laughs> Lena was asleep, and the dog wasn't barking, and the kids weren't home. And the reason I know it was him, because he didn't talk in my ear, he talked in my heart. And he instantly said this, The proof of salvation, every evidence of the life in you, remember to tell the people tomorrow, is a person. It is not something that you do. It is not something you are doing. It is not some attitude you are maintaining. It is not some feeling that you conjure up when you read the Bible. Remember to tell them that the things that John wrote about, all the things are a person. You begin to get that message? Okay, let me demonstrate. Let me mention a few of the things John mentions as proof of salvation. He says, These things have I written unto you. Here's what he wrote in 1 John 5. Here is that eternal life. I've known this eternal life, and I know this eternal life. Remember what he said at the beginning of his letter? I want to tell you what this eternal life is like. And he began to name the characteristics of this eternal life. He began to describe the nature of this eternal life. And lo and behold, as I read First John, I say, hey, these characteristics are in me. This nature is in me. Oh, John said, you got my message. I wrote these things that you might know that you have eternal life. Look around inside you. Do you see any evidence of this eternal life living there? This life is a son. It's a person. Now listen to the first thing. 
that which we have seen and heard, after he talks about this eternal life, he says, that which we have seen and heard, verse 3, declare we unto you that ye may also have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, and these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. This then is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, we walk in darkness, we lie, we don't tell the truth. But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And then he goes on to say, if we say we have no sin, we've deceived ourselves and the truth is not in us. But oh, how gladly now we confess our sin and know that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and that Jesus Christ the righteous has been made the propitiation for our sins, but not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. That's a whole mouthful. Okay? I'll tell you what that means. The very first evidence of that life in me that John names is the evidence of a thing called fellowship. Fellowship is two fellows in a ship. It's joint participation in something that both have in common. Until I was saved, I never knew what the word fellowship meant. I had many associations with people. But this fellowship doesn't have to do with people primarily. It has to do with me having fellowship with God and with His Son, Jesus Christ, and with those who since the day that Jesus Christ walked on this earth have fellowship with him. What do we have in common? What does God and I have in common? We both believe the record he gave of his son. What do we have in common? We both believe that the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, has cleansed me from all sin. We both believe that he is eternally satisfied for all my sins. We both believe that I can now freely own up to sin. If we say we have no sin, the truth is not as all the truth is in me now. And I can face up to it and say, yes, Lord, there's sin. There's sin in my nature my old nature, there's sin by the members of my body, there's sin in my reprobate mind, but oh, I thank God there's no sin in Jesus and there's no sin in heaven, and there's no sin in that new little man that's born inside of me. And I thank God for this. God and I believe the same thing, and that puts us in fellowship. And you know where our fellowship is? It's two fellows in a ship. Two people jointly participating in something that both hold in common. Do you know what it is that God and I hold in common? It's Jesus Christ, His Son. Do you know how we hold Him in common? Jesus is in the Father, and Jesus is in me. <laughs> and I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. And is this not what He prayed for in John 17? He said, Oh, I pray that there might be one with us like I'm one with you, Father. That prayer has come to pass in me, thank God. Christ is in me. God was in Christ when he reconciled me unto himself. Now Christ is in me, now that I have been reconciled to God. This is what we have fellowship in. This is what we jointly partake in. Jesus is in me, and Jesus is in the Father. The Father's in Jesus, and the Father's in me. I have that fellowship. <laughs> do you have it? Thank God I do. Me and God believe a lot. <laughs> now, it isn't he believes like I do. It's that I believe like he does. Yeah. I used to didn't believe like he did. I believe like he does now. Once I didn't believe what he preached, but I do believe what he preaches now. I once didn't think like he thinks, but I think like he thinks now. I believe about sin what he believes about sin, and I believe about the blood of Jesus Christ what he believes about it. I believe that he is satisfied with Jesus, and that makes me satisfied with Jesus. 
And because I'm satisfied and he's satisfied, we have this sweet fellowship. Isn't it precious? We just have this most precious fellowship, the fellowship between myself and God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then also, I have this sweet fellowship with John. I have the same sweet fellowship with John, and I have it with Paul, and I have it with every believer who ever lived, and I have it with believers who are presently living. But I can't have it with anybody in religion. It isn't mine to conjure up. It's nothing that I can do. It's either there or it isn't there. And I've experienced it wherever I've gone. I've met people whose names I didn't know, whose faces I had never seen. And ten seconds after I arrived on the scene, we were having sweet fellowship because I found out that we were two fellows in the same ship. We both had Jesus living in us. It was really Jesus, you see, having fellowship, not me. Just having fellowship through me and in me. You know what makes my fellowship with the Father? Jesus in me. See, the churches teach us and have taught us for years that we make fellowship with the Father by reading our Bibles and praying and giving out tracts and going to church, right? If you don't do those things, you don't have fellowship with God. You'll be out of fellowship with God. You can't be out of fellowship because the fellowship of God is in you. Jesus is my fellowship with the Father. <laughs> Does that make sense? Is it coming through clear? Jesus is my fellowship with the Father. He's in me, and He's in the Father. And Jesus is my fellowship with every other believer. That's the reason why you're wasting your time to try to whip up fellowship with a believer when you start talking about churches and preachers and doctrines and theology and do's and don'ts and laws and rules and regulations and accusing and condemning and, and all this other stuff that goes along with the religious world. You're wasting your time. Every believer carries about within him instantaneous fellowship. The fellowship is a person. It's Jesus Christ. We have him in common. <laughs> he's my groom and he's your groom. And so when we get together like two silly people in love, we just want to talk about her husband. <laughs> Let's don't talk about anything else. Let's talk about her husband. That's where fellowship is. You can't have that unless... The person who makes fellowship lives in you. God has by His Spirit given us this witness. Read it in Romans 8, verse 16. That it is God's Spirit in us who bears testimony with our spirit that we are the sons of God. And the Scriptures teach that Jesus Christ lives in me by His Holy Spirit. So it is Jesus Christ bearing testimony with my testimony, with my, with my spirit, that I am the Son of God. How does he do it? Because he talks to his Father in me and calls him Abba Father. Something never happened before until I say. I always talked to God, and I always talked about God. And when I prayed, I always prayed, Almighty God or to the Creator or the Almighty. But I never knew any intimacy down in my heart. I never knew any personal affection down in my heart. I never knew any personal relationship down in my heart to Almighty God and the Creator of this universe until His Son came to live in me and start talking to His Daddy through me. And when I began to walk around in this world after getting saved, conscious that somebody was down inside of me talking to God like he's his daddy, I said, something funny going on. And I discovered what that was. It's exactly what the New Testament says it is. It's Christ in me. Am I crazy? It's a good kind of crazy. I mean, if you've got to be crazy, go first class. <laughs> okay? The second thing that John mentions in here that I want to call to your attention, 
You just take the bones and go home and put the meat on them. In chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, Hereby we do know that we know him. If, if we keep his commandment. Oh, I died just now. If I keep his commandments, that's not just ten of them. That must be at least a hundred thousand of them. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Who is the love of God perfected? And it says that the love of God perfected, Jesus Christ, is in the man who keeps the word of God. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Let me tell you a little bit about what the word keep means. It has no reference to performance. I didn't write the word. I'm just interpreting it. It has to do with the attitude of the heart. It has to do with what a man feels in his heart toward the word of God, the attitude of his heart towards the word of God. And I want to tell you that I discovered from the day I was saved, and I discovered it anew this morning, and afresh this moment while I'm preaching, that there has been in me for lo these many years a holy fear of grieving the blessed Lord Jesus in me, a holy desire down deep inside of me to do what he wants done, although many times in my stupidity and in my ignorance I've failed to do just that. You hear me? I was talking about this last night. I was talking about Romans 14. Here's two men. One of them says it's wrong to keep the Sabbath day, and anybody who keeps the Sabbath day offends God and sins against Him. And here's another Christian on the other side who says, Well, I know that's you're honest in saying that. I know that's the way you feel. I know that's the way you interpret Jesus in your heart. I know that's what you think Jesus said to you. But in my heart, it's been an entirely different experience. In my heart, I feel that it's just the other way around. One man says it's sin to keep the Sabbath. Another man says it's sin not to keep the Sabbath. And Paul says both of them, honestly, in their heart, walk where they walk because they think that's where Jesus wants them to walk. And he says they're both right. You know why they're both right? Because Jesus understands and he loves me and Jesus is interested in one thing in me. If I do what I do for Jesus, I can't do any wrong. No way. He's interested in one thing first. What do you really feel towards me? Do you really want what I want in your life? I testify to you before God that since the day I was saved, I have never wanted anything in my life but what he wanted. Many have been the judges of the outward appearance of my life who have told me I either did or did not what pleased him. But I can tell you before God I have never had any other desire foremost in my heart but this to do what he wants done in my life, to be what he wants me to be, to be in the will of God has been the desire of 28 years of my life. And that's got to come from somebody besides a man. Who is it that wills in me the will of God? Who is it that wants in me what his father wants? Who is it that gives me a holy desire to keep the word of God as best I understand? It's Jesus in me willing that because it's him who came to do his father's will and it's him who lives in me now to do his father's will and I think one of the greatest evidences of salvation is a desire that you can't fight a desire that you can't kill a desire that won't die a desire that won't go away and that desire is whether I live or die Christ be magnified in my body you understand it kind of preaching
The only trouble any Christian ever had with doing the will of God was one thing only. People say they don't know what the will of God is. Let me tell you something. The will of God is for you to want the will of God regardless of what the will of God is. And when you're sure that you want the will of God above everything else in this world, you'll know the will of God. Just as simple as A, B, C. You don't know the will of God because you don't want the will of God. You lie when you say you want the will of God. You say you abide in Him, but you don't have any desire to keep His commandments. You say He lives in you, but you have no desire to keep His Word. I'm talking about a holy fear of grieving the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm talking about something happening down inside of me that gives me a distrust in myself, a holy confidence in Him, an unholy confidence in myself. I'm talking about an attitude of heart that wants to do whatever he wants done. If Jesus Christ materialized right here beside me and I could just take a moment to examine the wounds in his hands and in his side to make sure that he was really my Jesus and he told me to jump off the Belfry Bridge, it would take as long to get that done as it would take me to get in my car and drive to Belfry Bridge. There isn't anything on God's earth I wouldn't do there isn't any commandment he's ever given I wouldn't keep. There isn't any word he's ever uttered in me that I wouldn't make the command of my life. My faults are simply the faults of all men of flesh. I hear voices that aren't his. I yield to influences that are not his. I'm attracted by a satanic system that deceives me and deludes me. The errors are not in the attitude of my heart. The sins are not in my feelings toward him. The errors and the sins of my life are due to the frailties of a man made of dust. Do you understand that? What did Jesus say when he came into the world to take a body that had been prepared for him? His announcement was, I come to do thy will, O God. And when he came to live in this body right here, which was prepared also for him by the Holy Ghost, by a conception, yes, conception, that took place by the power of the Holy Ghost. This body, too, was prepared for his indwelling. And when he came to live in it, he made an announcement the day he moved into it. He looked up into the face of his Father and he said, I come to do thy will, O God. And his will has been the most important, the driving force, the motivation. It's become the only purpose in life. If I can't do the will of God, I don't want to live. That isn't natural to me. I didn't conjure that up because the Christian world says if you don't feel like that, you ain't a Christian. I can't help it. I hate it sometimes. Because the flesh wants to do something. He wants to will something. He wants to be something. He wants to go someplace. But from the very day I was saved, I was conscious that I wasn't my own anymore and there wasn't anything I could do about it. Somebody else running my life. Somebody else talking inside of me. Somebody else motivating me down inside. Somebody else desiring down inside of me the things that often I didn't want. And somebody making me stand when I didn't want to stand and when I said I couldn't stand, and somebody making me go on when I said I couldn't go on, and somebody who wouldn't let me quit when I said I'm going to quit, and somebody who said, you'll love whether you love or not. You can't hate when I'm in you. I'm the love of God perfected. See, this ain't religion I'm talking about. This, I'm talking about somebody. I'm talking about Jesus. Do you know him? I'm talking about somebody that's real, lives in me. Hey, two people can't live together for 28 years without knowing something about each other. And he's been paddling around the house of my heart for 28 years. And he's been head of the house. Regardless of how it seemed to you, he's been head of the house.
I, I got to go on because this message is bigger than all of us. But let me just mention two or three more things. I will just mention them and we'll close. I there's too much. Here's the whole Bible. Listen. He that saith, he who keeps on saying he's in the light and habitually hates his brother is in darkness even to this very moment. But he that loves his brother abides in the light and there is no occasion of scandal or snare or stumbling in him. Listen carefully. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer and ye know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And let me read it again. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has Jesus living in him. He's not talking about murder that takes place in the flesh. He's talking about the murder that takes place in the heart. Hereby we know the love of God. Listen. Because he laid down his life for us, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Who has this world's goods and sees his brother have need and shuts up his bowels of compassion from him? How can he say that the love of God dwells in him? Now listen carefully. Do you love? Be careful how you answer because I'm about to tell you that if you say you love, you lie because you don't even know what love is. God is love. You never loved anybody, and you never will love anybody, and you can't love anybody. But you say, I've experienced love. If you've experienced true love, I promise you this, it wasn't your love. It was somebody else's. It was the perfect love of God, the Lord Jesus Christ you experienced. Do you mean to tell me that Jesus Christ lives in you and you can look on your brother and see a need in that brother and not be stirred in the bowels of your compassion toward him? I'm not talking about giving him your money or giving him the shirt off your back or loaning him your automobile or your motorcycle or going over and helping him plow his garden or something else. Hey, I'm talking about needs much worse than that. Those are needs I can get met on welfare and with food stamps. How can you look at a brother and a sister and see spiritual need in them and hate them and then say to yourself, Jesus lives in me. You're a liar. I don't care how much you dislike that person. I don't care how much their personality rubs you wrong. I don't care how you may disapprove of what you see in their life. I don't care of how the things of their life turn you off. If Jesus lives in them and Jesus lives in you, you look upon the need of that brother, that sister, and there'll be something stirring down deep in the bowels of your compassion. I'll tell you what it is stirring down there. It's Jesus stirring down there. And it's Jesus saying, don't matter that you don't approve of the way he walks. It don't matter the way he looks. It don't matter what color he is. It don't matter that he's poor or rich. It don't matter that you don't like him. It doesn't matter that his personality is 180 degrees from yours. It doesn't matter that he doesn't like you. What matters is he's mine, and I love him, and I live in him, and I live in you, and I love you, and I love him through you. You can't conjure that up, kids. I've seen some of you try, and you'll choke on it. You'll choke on it. You ain't never found enough religion in this world to love people you don't like. You can love anybody that you like. That isn't easy to go around and whip all them love words on people you like. Try to do it and keep a straight face when you can't stand the person you're saying you love. Say it don't make any sense? Good. Now we're getting someplace. I can love anybody in my flesh that gives me a cause to love them. But you don't seem to be listening to God's message. He preached it when he walked around the streets of Jerusalem. He kept saying little things like, I say, love your enemy. Do good to them, I hate you. And it blew the Pharisees' minds. 
They said, the man is out of his mind. How can anybody love his enemy and do good and bless those that hate him? He didn't tell them how to do it. He just said, that's your problem. I say, that's what God says love is. If you can't do it, your problem is you haven't got God and you haven't got the love of God. That's what Jesus was trying to say to them. And this is what John is saying to you, and this is what he said to those he wrote to. Go on and keep on saying that you abide in him. Keep on saying that the love of God abides in you. If that's your assurance of salvation, just hang on to that little verse and say, I know the love of God abides in me. But if you keep on saying that you abide in him, when you know very good and well, if you'd be honest with yourself, you look down in your heart, you hate those that your heart tells you are born of God, you hate them. You're dwelling in darkness. But when you find yourself experiencing a stirring in the bowels of your compassion, when something's touched down inside toward another who in the flesh you can't bear, it's someone down inside of you reaching through you, loving, and doesn't even ask your permission. Sometime when you get a week off, do me a favor, read my book. It's called Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. I wrote all about it and put it down on white paper in black ink so you could understand what I'm talking about. Do you love? No, you don't. But God loves, and His perfect love lives in the believer. And His perfect love loves through the believer, those whom the Father loves in Him. I'm just going to touch on one more thing. There's many things in this epistle. One of them, oh, it's precious. <laughs> one of the evidences of the Lord Jesus in us is a thing that he calls an anointing, an unction from the Holy One. And the unction is a person that's Jesus himself. And what it really means in plain language is there's somebody down inside of me that knows the truth from error, that can tell the difference between a truth and a lie. So that I don't need anybody, I don't need a program to tell the umpires from the players. <laughs> I don't need some rule book to go around figuring out who lies and who doesn't lie. That there's someone, read it all, please, when you go home. It's in the second chapter of First John. You don't need that any man should teach you the difference between truth and error. There's someone in you, he says, that knows the difference and will tell you the difference. And if any man comes to you and he speaks of God, you'll hear him. Who is it that hears the truth of God in my heart? It's Jesus. And who is it that tells the difference between truth and error in my heart? It's Jesus. Just quickly. If Jesus lives in you, you have a whole different attitude toward the world. Whole different attitude. You once felt a certain way towards the world, now you feel differently towards the world. And it's really crazy. <laughs> My flesh still loves the world. My flesh still wants the world. My flesh still lusts for the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is still there. My mind still goes after the world and wants the world. <laughs> but in spite of all of that influence, there's somebody down inside of me that hates the very thing that my flesh loves. Somebody down inside of me that's turned off by the very things that turn my flesh on. There's somebody down in there that's always a wet blanket when my flesh is enjoying himself. Somebody down inside of me always pulling me back when I'm reaching out for the world. Somebody down inside of me that's always saying, these things are not of your father, and they're not of my father, and I don't like them. You can take me, you can make me go with you, but you can't make me like where you are or what you do. You know what I'm talking about? I've had this trouble for 28 years. Boy, he's made me so miserable at times that I just wish that he'd stay home, you know, when I go. But he won't. He says, you go, I go, because we're joined together, we're glued together, you're stuck with me, and I'm stuck with you. And we're going to go, he says, but you know I'm going to be miserable while we're there. And you know if I'm miserable, you're going to be miserable too. And sometimes I say, okay, I can bear the misery and I'll go, but oh, it's bad, isn't it? You know what I'm talking about? Yes, sir. Now, this is the last thing I want to tell you. I promise this is the last. 
thing I want to tell you at this moment. <laughs> In chapter 4, listen carefully, and I am going to close this message. Chapter 4, verse 17, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There's no fear in love. Listen. But perfect love turns fear out of doors. Because fear has mental anguish, and he that suffers from mental anguish is not made perfect in love. The perfect love that he's talking about is not something we attain to in our spiritual life. It's someone. He woke me at 2.30 to remind me this morning, be sure and tell the people that all these things are not things you do. All these things are not things you conjure up. These are not things you accomplish. These are things that you do not attain. Tell them that these things are me. The perfect love of God is Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ lives in you, the first thing He does is go to the door and cast the fear out of your heart that you've had all of your life toward judgment and toward God. You'll never be afraid of God again. And you'll never be afraid of judgment again. Not ever. I haven't done a lot of right things in my 28 years of being a Christian. And I've done a whale of a lot of wrong things. But I want to tell you two things that I never did do in 28 years. Never! That's a big statement. I'm aware of that. Never! Have I ever been afraid of God? And never have I been afraid of judgment. I'm not saying just every once in a while. I'm saying never with a capital NEB. <laughs> if I ever see a fear of judgment in my heart and a fear of God in my heart, I will know that I never did have the assurance of salvation and I never did believe what God said about His Son. Because here's what God said in His record and in His testimony. He said, you don't have to ever be afraid of judgment again because when Jesus died on the cross... You died with him, and your judgment has already taken place, and I already condemned you to hell, and I already sent you to hell, but I also brought you back from there and glorified you and seated you in heaven so you don't have to worry about whether you're going to heaven or hell or not. It's all settled. It's all over. Don't worry about it anymore. And when Jesus came to live in me, the first thing he did was open the front door, and he turned around, and he said to the fear in my heart, Get out! That's what the Greek says. He turned it out of doors. Because he said, you'll never give this dear person any more mental anguish. Not ever again. The mental anguish is ended. Do you know what the believer knows? Here's what he knows. <laughs> he knows that at this very moment, he is as Jesus is. And let me say it like I love to say it. And how is Jesus? He's fine. He's perfect. He's glorified. He's seated at the right hand of God's throne. He's accepted. He's God's perfect love. How is He? He's beautiful. How am I? I'm beautiful. How am I? Risen with Him. Glorified with Him and like Him. Seated with Him at the right hand accepted by his Father and my Father, his God and my God. What's to be afraid of? Therefore, being justified by faith, I have peace facing God. The peace that I have facing God is Jesus. He's facing him now, <laughs> and he's my peace. 
You say you're not ever afraid of God? No. Not ever. A few weeks ago, I, I'm not going to give you any details, but a few weeks ago, for just a few minutes, it's the first time since three and a half years ago at least, that I thought for sure, down deep in my heart, that I was going to die. Looked like I was just a few minutes away. I just had peace. There wasn't any panic. There wasn't any fear. There wasn't any mental anguish. There wasn't any questions. There wasn't any doubts. There wasn't any worries. There wasn't any loose ends. It's just hurry up. Come on. I don't have any fear of God. You know why I don't have any fear of God? He's my daddy. He's my daddy. He loves me. And He's as anxious to see me as I am to see Him. He will run out to greet me like He did the prodigal. He's already run out at the cross. Put His best robe on me. Put the ring of sonship on my fingers. Already covered my naked feet with the good news of His gospel. He's waiting now in heaven to embrace me when I come in. He's going to say, Welcome home, son. Welcome home, son. We missed you up here. Welcome Welcome. We love you here. I know that. But it isn't me that knows that. It's His Son in me. You know why He'll welcome me home? Because Jesus will be coming home. Hey, does that make sense? Do you know why the angels will rejoice? Because Jesus will be coming home. Do you know why the fatted calf will be killed? Because Jesus is coming home. Jesus in me. When I leave this world, He's going to go with me. When He enters the gates of glory, I enter with Him. When the Father embraces Him, the Father embraces me. As far as God is concerned, when He sees me, He sees the Son. And when He sees the Son, He sees me. That's the fellowship we have.